Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is November 8, 2020, 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, and I'm here in the beautiful capital of California, Sacramento. And we're here today with Mr. Ron Schofield, and we identify him as a forensic graphic artist. I'm sorry, forensic gra graphic analyst amongst his many other accomplishments. And he's going to be doing a really interesting study, a breakdown, a forensic breakdown on the famed photographer Dorothea Lang. And Ron will explain who she is. But first of all, Ron, could you just give us a sort of a quick nutshell uh, synopsis of a, a long and illustrious and exciting, very interesting career, which hopefully we can talk about in depth uh, at another time uh, once we go through the Dorothea Lang. So Ron, could you Take that for sure. us, please. Yes, and and uh, Daryl, thank you so much for inviting me. This is uh, this is really fun. Um, yeah, I started my professional career as a uh, cartoonist, uh, working in the animation industry. I had a long, happy career with uh, Walt Disney uh, in Burbank, and. Toward the end of my time at Disney, I suddenly took a huge interest in photography and I turned that into uh, a professional skill. I shot for eight years as a corporate photographer. And as a child, somewhere when I, in my childhood, I realized that I had a, I had a special talent for what we, what's now called facial gestalt, facial gestalt. I didn't know that at the time. And uh, so I'm gonna, uh, today I wanna talk about the migrant mother photo shoot, which includes probably the most famous photograph taken in the United States. Um, it's a big story uh, because it's, it's all about the uh, Farm Security Administration, uh, FDR's support of the monopolists, big agriculture. Uh, Dorothea Lang uh, was the photographer and she is already uh, a huge uh, she, she's one of the huge giants of photographic history worldwide. Um, but at the time that she took this photograph, she was working for the Farm Security Administration. She was work for hire uh, and she was following a creative brief that was given to her and all the photographers by her boss, Roy Stryker. And the creative brief was very simple. He would just list what he wanted to see in the images. And he gave directions like poverty, hopelessness, destitution, starvation, struggle. So the photographers went out to try to find that. Now, Ron, let me interrupt you for a second. Are those the terms that he used, those exact terms? Or are you summarizing it? Strike I'm summarizing, but okay. it, in another conversation, I can, I can produce the actual creative briefs and it's astonishing uh, how he was directing the people because he, he was an art director in, in that capacity, he was really an art director. It was a, it was a huge new program uh, that the government started. And it was, I think the first documentary photojournalism uh, program that the government ever uh, worked on. Even so, before the films of all the propaganda films like Frank Capra, the Signal Corps and World War II. This really yeah. was the predecessor yeah, to yeah, that. Yeah, because this this started, uh, I think, 
Uh, it started in 33. It was called the Resettlement Administration at that point. And they changed names in 1935 to the Farm Security Administration. Mm -hmm. And another thing I should mention, you know, Dorothea Lang, as I've said, she, she's a giant in photo, uh, photography history. And at the time she took um, the photograph, the migrant mother photograph, she was married to Paul Taylor. Paul Taylor's a good guy. He spent his whole, he was an economist. Uh, he worked uh, at UC Berkeley and he spent his whole career uh, working to improve uh, the conditions of migrant workers, uh, farmers, and um, uh, he was in support of the small farm. Now that is a, that, that's in direct conflict with FDR's program. FDR was trying to produce uh, propaganda to support mechanized farming, big agriculture. He was, wow. he did not like small farms. He wanted them consolidated. And, you know, he, he always supported the monopolists. They called them mercantilists back then. It's another story. We're not, we don't have time for that, but that's the background. So, and, and I, I should say, cause I'm, I'm walking out on the edge here, uh, criticizing Dorothea Lang. I mean, she's a, she's a big hero in the U S um, so what I see, what, what I've gleaned from my uh, research is that she was an enthusiastic propagandist. She even said at one point, I don't know why propaganda is a dirty word. Hmm. All right. Now, she, I think she thought that following the creative brief was supporting the work of her husband, Paul Taylor. I don't think she, uh, she realized that it was really in support of big agriculture. So I, sh I should say that. Um, so I, I've got some notes here. I'm sorry if I look down from the camera. I just want to make sure I stay on track and I, I keep us within a reasonable time. Um, That's an excellent introduction. It really provides, uh, I mean, I, I've already learned so much in five minutes here. All You're right. taking down a, uh, like a, 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 in the overused word, an icon, right? An icon of American or international photography, but that's what we do on this channel, Ron. All right, well, <laughs> at, the, at the end of our, uh, at the end of my, uh, presentation or the end of this discussion, um, I will uh, make reference to and, and bring Dorothea back to the uh, uh, to the position that she she holds now. And that's based on uh, her photographs of the Japanese American incarceration. Right. Okay. Those uh, and, and the irony there is we haven't seen most of those photos. So, but I'll talk about that at the end. Um, so, okay. So, so what I think we have, uh, what we're gonna discuss is this photo shoot that occurred. And I should now probably switch to a few visuals if you don't mind. There we go. Can we see that? Yes, perfectly. All Let right. Let me center it in my screen here. Yeah. All right. Well, great. This is the what the government has always referred to as the migrant mother. It's it's got to be one of the top 10 most famous 
photos worldwide. And I'm sure uh, much of your audience has seen this photo and they're familiar with it because it's been so widely published over the, you know, the past 80 years. Um, I think this, the way I see it, I think this photo was the result of a paparazzi looking for the money shot. And that's the controversy uh, about Dorothea Lang. She was enthusiastic. Uh, she was in pursuit of answering the creative brief, fulfilling the creative brief. And the money shot, of course, is handing that into your boss and getting paid and getting further assignments. So uh, this, this photo was taken in March of 1936 in Napomo, California. And Napomo is at the Southern end of the coastal Valley of California. It extends all the way from, let's say Santa Maria, all the way up to Palo Alto. And when I was a kid, I grew up in California, so very familiar with the territory uh, all the way from LA up to San Francisco. I've driven on 101 many, many times. Um, so Dorothea was driving home, uh, to Berkeley. She was driving north home to Berkeley and she says she saw something interesting and she she drove further north. She drove past Napomo. She was thinking about it and then she says she turned around and drove back and showed up uh, on the scene. Now I want to uh, I want to go through the uh, photos and I'm, I'm calling this the migrant mother photo shoot. So, all right. So thinking like a paparazzi, uh, I'm going to describe it that way. This is the first shot. She's, uh, Dorothea's uh, gotten out of the car. She has her camera and <clears throat> Her, her car is probably right behind her and she's walking toward the this lean to and this is a grab shot uh, you can see by the uh, body language of her subjects that they are uh, they don't want her there and so she grabs a shot now you got to remember that uh, Dorothea was a very skilled photographer and everything was manual then. They didn't have light meters. You had to know your settings. And you can see that, that this, is a, this is a poorly photographed image. It's, uh, therefore, it's a grab shot. And it's slightly out of focus. And it's not in the Library of Congress. All of the, the see, let me see. Five of the photos are in the Library of Congress. This one isn't. I think it's in the collection with the Oakland Museum. Now that's very interesting because it it shows it tells a different story, and it's in my, my opinion only analyzing these photos. This is the first shot. All right. She now she's uh, about twenty feet, uh, maybe ten feet away, and. There would, have, there would have been some conversation. And I think what was said was, I'm from the government, I'm a photographer, I'm assigned to photograph people in your condition, migrant workers, something like that. And she moves closer and she promises based on Florence's story. And I should, I should mention now that the migrant mother 
is really, her name was Florence Owens Thompson. So I'm gonna to refer to her as Florence because we find out 43 years later, we get the other side of the story. And in Florence's story, she said that Dorothea promised she wouldn't publish him. And Dorothea is still working the scene and she senses there's a money shot here. She's within two or three feet. So she's working at the area. This is what photojournalists do. They just, they just move around and they wait to see it. And on her fourth shot, she got it. She found it. And that's it. <laughs> My grandmother. And now there's a, we can't go into all the, the stories about this shot. I mean, it's just such a huge subject. Books have been written about it. Scholars, a lot smarter than me, they've analyzed and discussed it. But uh, I recently, just a couple of days ago, I came across um, a book um, where the guy says, a published book, which I just ordered, by the way, I'm, I can't wait to get it because I want to read it uh, and find out. He says this is Poe's. Um, and, you know, I, I looked at this and I've heard that before. And I looked at this photo and I think, well, you know, because the, the little girl's looking away so that you, you focus your attention on Florence's face. Uh, yeah, it's pretty, it's a pretty cool setup, pretty good composition. But I was in Jiffy Lube one time in the waiting room and I saw a mother and two daughters and th that this, a very similar composition formed right in front of me. So I knew, you know, th this probably wasn't posed. That, that's, Dorothea didn't go that far. So, and, and another reason I know that this, it, it's the money shot for sure, but I know that it's not a perfect composition because if she was going to pose the shot, she would have excluded. Let me see. I got to use my, can you see my cursor here? Oh, yes. All right. This is the one of the poles supporting the lean to and she would have framed it so that wasn't seen and someone probably Dorothea tried to erase uh Florence's hand which is uh she's supporting her, her herself with her left arm on this uh post Hmm. So th that kind of imperfection tells me that th this was uh, straight photojournalism. All right. Then uh, this is a backup shot, meaning she she might as well get one more in the camera, but she's she already knows she's got the money shot. So she's not going to waste any more time trying to work the scene and get something better. Uh, Okay, and then you come to this is the sixth shot in the in the series. And I, I've assigned. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. It's it's the fifth shot in the series. Is that correct? Let me see. One, two, three, four, five. Now I've I've mislabeled that. Very sorry. It is the sixth shot. This is also not to be found in the Library of Congress. Okay, and I came across this online. I, I just it, I stopped in my tracks because you know I'm always doing research on this, and I'd never seen this before. Look at that! Look at that! The, those eyes! Look at the look that Florence is giving the camera. This is the first time that she looks at the camera in the photo shoot, and you you can see. She never changes her expression. Okay. Now, in mm -hmm. terms of um, in terms of paparazzi, 
um, people know ab about modern paparazzi. They know about celebrities being confronted with paparazzi photographers. And that's essentially what this was in 1936. And celebrities though are very sophisticated. They, what they do when they see a paparazzi, they adopt a neutral face and they don't give anger like they used to. You know, they used to blow up and get in confrontations. Not anymore. They just, they just have a neutral face. They don't show anger and they don't show happiness or, or they don't laugh and smile and they never look at the camera. And the reason they do that is because uh, the paparazzi will, will know within two or three shots, he's not going to get anything of value and he'll, he'll go off and try to find another subject. So it gets them out of the area quicker. And that's what I think uh, Dorothea was doing. And we'll talk about that in a second when we hear her side of the story. And then this is the final shot in the series. Uh, Dorothea is relaxed now because she's got the money shot. This is uh, really the establishing shot. This is to show <clears throat> the conditions that uh, uh, these people were in at the at that moment but uh, i i have to i have to say uh there's a big deception in this shot um on the left side outside of the frame were about there was about a thousand migrant workers in a camp about 50 yards away and i think to the right of the frame uh was where the family car was parked. And I'll talk about the importance of the automobile in just a second. Um, so there, there's some deception here uh, uh, and it, it's, it's framed this way and it's deliberate, unfortunately. Dorothea is trying to um, emphasize the isolation and hopelessness and I'll, I'll read her quote in just a moment. Um, to give you a little um, visual, this, this is the car that uh, Dorothea drove, drove up to um, the lean-to in 1936. This is a 1934 Woody uh, Ford V8. Hmm. Uh, Pretty fancy car for the time, um, and Dorothea is sitting on 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 the roof here, and she's holding the camera that she used to take the migrant mother photo, and it's a huge shoebox size camera, uh, just amazing that she could hand hold that camera. You know, Dorothea was only about five feet tall. So here's a, here's a picture of her uh, uh, photographing some kids, but also in California. And she's, you can see she's the size relationship of Dorothea to the camera. I, I can't imagine, I, even I would, I probably wouldn't be able to handle that camera. Um, and that, that speaks to her skill. Here's a, a photo of her boss, Roy Stryker. Um, he was a, an economist by training, but he, he turned into a, a, a very sophisticated public relations guy. And he, he led the propaganda um, of, of the photos. And he's the, oh. guy that was, he's the guy that was delivering the creative briefs. Now, am I correct in assuming that Stryker was a new dealer? Oh, definitely. He, he was working for, uh, basically, he was two steps away from FDR in, in oh terms of, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. His, his boss, Stryker's boss name was Tugwell. And I think Tugwell was in constant conversation with 
uh, FDR. So uh, Stryker was in, he was in the inner circle. Okay. And yeah, he was fully on board with Big Agra. And, you, you know, they, if I can just mention, they, it, it got ridiculous. They, they accused the Oklahoma farmers called Okies, you know, they called them Okies. That was, uh, that was a big part of the population that uh, migrated west to pick crops. They, they all came from family farms. Most of them had a farm and, and the government said that the Dust Bowl was created by poor farming practices. And that if they had education from the government, that wouldn't have happened. It's ridiculous. It's like climate change, you know. It was simply a drought, and there was the bull weevil, and it destroyed the crops. That's what happened. But they that it, it, what a what a thing to say about a a group of people, all family farmers. They were too stupid to know how to treat the land. That was basically the message. And it and it was written on a lot of the photo uh, on a lot of the photographs, and that kind of copy was picked up by the newspapers. Now, so, Ron, do you see a, a connection there with these uh, mythologies, contemporaneous mythologies that were constructed back in the so-called New Deal, with some of the contemporary, the present mythologies that we're seeing around global warming and climate change and all the other uh, actually, fairy tales? It's the same thing. It's the same thing. Uh, you, you remember the Club of Rome started the, what we're calling climate change. They started it saying that we were going to have a new ice age. <laughs> I remember that, yeah. Yeah, and then, and then, it, evolved, then it evolved into, uh, oh no, it's not an ice age, we're, it's a global warming. And, but all of it was, uh, supposedly caused by humans, the anthropogenic climate change. Mm -hmm. And they've never, they've never changed their, uh, their narrative on that. And this would, this uh, propaganda program uh, regarding the migrant workers in the depression is the same thing. They, they were blaming it on the people. And, <laughs> The weather, I, I tell you, my opinion, the weather hasn't changed. You, you're going to have, you're going to have droughts, you're going to have hurricanes, you're going to have too much rain. It, it, it's all just natural. That's my opinion. All right, so uh, what this, this illustrates the boss, Roy Stryker. There he is, Roy Stryker. If he didn't like something, he'd punch a hole in the negative. Oh my gosh. Yeah, so it was actually destroying government property because this, uh, all, this whole program was of course taxpayer funded. And uh, I should mention for uh, your viewers that they can see all of this on uh, li uh, the Library of Congress on online, loc.gov. You can go there and you can see all of these fabulous photos. There's, I think there's 200,000 and they've digitized, I would say they've digitized about half of them. And, there, and there's no copyright on it. If, if you wanna, if you have a favorite photo, you can download it and print it, put it on the wall. Don't don't buy one online from some guy for 150 bucks. You can get it for free. All right. Now I, there's we'll get to the two story part right now. And how am I doing on time? We're at 38 minutes. Uh, I'll let you know when we're closing in on an hour. Okay, good. I, well, it sounds like I got plenty of time. I'm getting near the the end here um, of my uh, current research. All right. So we've 
we've talked about the paparazzi. We've talked about the enthusiastic uh, propagandist, Dorothea, with the uh, modification that I think she, she thought she was always helping her, her husband, Paul Taylor, uh, who, who it turns out he was a good guy. When I first looked at Paul Taylor, I was reading about him. I thought, uh oh, this guy's, he could be a socialist. Not, not the case at all. It's a good guy. We can't go into that right now. All right. So here's the government story. And I, I have to read this. These are quotes. Um, the first one is from Roy Stryker. He's the big boss. He's the one that wrote the uh, shot list, the creative brief. And here's what he says about the migrant mother photo. The migrant mother photo has achieved near mythical status, symbolizing, if not defining, an entire era in United States history. It's the ultimate photo of the Depression era. Lang never surpassed it. To me, it was the picture. The others were marvelous, but that was special. She, referring to Florence Owens Thompson, the migrant mother, is immortal. Okay, that's Roy. And I think when he said that Dorothea never surpassed it. Dorothea was, from that point on, she was living in the shadow of that photograph, and unfortunately. But she did, as we're gonna discuss in, in just a moment, she did surpass it. Um, all right, now here's what Dorothea Lang said about the encounter. And keep in mind my theory of the paparazzi. I saw and approached a hungry and desperate mother as if drawn by a magnet. I do not remember how I explained my presence or my camera to her, but I do remember she asked me no questions. I made five exposures working closer and closer from the same direction. I did not ask her name or her history. She told me her age, that was 32. She said that she had been living on frozen vegetables from the surrounding fields and birds that her children killed. She had just sold the tires from her car to buy food. There she sat in the lean-to with her children huddled around her. And she thought that my pictures might help her. And so she helped me. Amazing. All right. Amazing. So, yeah. So that's basically, that's the government story. <laughs> and uh, now, 43 years later, Florence Owens Thompson reveals herself. Uh, what, what happened, it's a, it's a great story. I mean, this is 43 years later in 1979, a, a Modesto newspaper published a commemorative article on the migrant mother photo. And, you know, it's always been a symbol of that whole depression era and newspapers were doing this a lot and finally Florence had had enough and she revealed herself and that she was still alive and she was living in Modesto and <laughs> she, she, she sent a letter to this newspaper and basically it started with I what, what did she say here um the exact quote, I wish she hadn't taken my picture. And then she went on to say how she never got a dime for it. And she was ashamed of 
her, her con the conditions. She didn't want to be photographed, but she was never, uh, she never sold the tires for food. Nobody was killing birds or eating frozen vegetables. And then that was the beginning. And we got the whole family story because uh, Florence went on to, at the time of the photograph, she had seven children and she went on to have 10 children. So a huge family. Well, the, the kids that were there during, uh, when, uh, during the photo shoot, when, uh, when the incident happened, they, uh, they spoke up too. And the, um, uh, the other famous quote, I, I have to kind of summarize their story, but the, the other famous quote is, uh, Mama, and this is by her son, Troy Owens, Mama was always afraid that the government would take her children away. And that's how she was her whole life. Wow. That, that tells us a lot different. That, that's a lot different story. So you go back and you look at this face and that's what you're seeing. She wants this, she, the government is right there in front of her and she does not want to antagonize them. She does not want to be found out. She just wants the government to go away. That's what I, that's what I see in the face. And by the way, uh, I, I've looked at hundreds and hundreds, there are a lot of famous photographers and I've looked at their photos uh, also working for the Farm Security Administration. And I, I, I tell you, I have never seen hopelessness, poverty, destitution. I've never seen that. What I've always seen without coaching is strength, endurance, self-reliance. Sometimes they look a little tired. The people look a little tired because they're on the road all the time. They're living rough. But I never see anyone that's going to give up. That's, that's been my uh, you know, going back to facial gestalt, that's what I see. So, um, all right, so we're, all, we're almost at the end here of this uh, focus. Um, Oh, this is an aerial view of the Nipomo area. Nipomo, yes, this is, the, this is the satellite view. And um, all right, so here's the here, here's what we learned from the um, uh, from the Thompson family. Um, they were on their way to Watsonville, which is north. And if you look at the satellite view, I've marked with a blue arrow right next to what's called, now is called Thompson Avenue. I'm wondering, did Napomo name Thompson Avenue after Florence? That's something I got to find out. But anyway. Yeah, interesting, yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. So Thompson Avenue was 101 in 1936. Okay, and which means can, it was a major north to south thorough of uh, highway, not a freeway, right? One hundred and one. Uh, yeah, it this of course was before. Uh, yeah, it was a highway. It mm -hmm. was a well maintained highway. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you look to the lower left, you see the um, or I would say the upper left. You see the red rectangle. Up, up here, see my cursor? Uh, I don't see the cursor, but. Okay, how about the red rectangle? I don't see, does that by the crick over there? Uh-huh. De La Sugi's crick or creek, if you will. <laughs> yes, yes, all right. Okay. Well, never mind. I think we've, we've got a different view uh, based on our screens, but anyway, the current 101 is down here. It runs down the left side of this uh, photograph. 
parallel to Thompson Avenue. And okay, now I see the cursor. It's moving. Oh, good. Yeah, and I mean, it was going. It's going too fast. Or uh, oh, I'm sorry. Do, do, yeah. you, do you see where? Do you see it now? It's stopped. no, no. no? It's All okay. right. Well, this slide may not, may not be uh, helpful right now. I, I'll. Uh, this is current anyway. Uh, that was like McDonald's showing in all of these contemporary stores and yeah. shops. Well, yeah, this is a Google satellite view. Oh, I see. I can see the badge of the 101 right next to the McDonald's. Yeah, yeah. So that's the current 101 freeway now. Now it's a freeway. And Thompson was the original 101 highway. Right. And, and that it. makes a difference because that's the road that both Dorothea and the Thompson family were traveling on, and they were both headed north. Dorothea was headed back to uh, Berkeley. And as we find out, the Thompson family was heading to Watsonville, where they had placement as pickers. Placement meaning they were hired. Mm -hmm. So they had a job. And um, OK, so here, here's the story. Um, they were headed to Watsonville. Uh, at the time, uh, Florence's boyfriend was named Jim Hill, and uh, they they both had placement in Watsonville, and that's where they were headed. And as they were approaching or nearing Napomo, uh, Jim wanted to pull over and tighten the tie-in chain, and they, it's like a fan belt, and. Uh, so what he did was pull off somewhere and he was observing what I'm calling grapes of wrath etiquette, which is very important. It, it was dangerous for uh, migrants to stop and blend into a, a picker camp because those were all uh, patrolled. Uh, the, the farm owner had people patrolling those camps to make sure that there was no squatters. Uh, it's 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 a it's another big story. So they would be observing that they didn't want to uh, antagonize anybody. So they pulled off, and they uh, and and then Jim worked on the timing chain and he broke it. And when it broke, it whipped it whipped across and, and punctured the radiator. So it was just like, what, it just got getting worse and worse. So he took the radiator out, he took the timing chain. They put it in a hand cart that apparently they had already. It was strapped onto the car somehow, part of the luggage that they carried. And Jim and two of Florence's sons, two boys, went into Napomo and got it repaired. So they had money. And while they were gone, uh, Dorothea shows up in her big, shiny Ford, you know, the Woody station wagon. The V8. And, and so following the Grapes of Wrath etiquette, they have play, they pitch the lean-to uh, separate from other people. So it's perfect for... Dorothea, who can claim that they were huddled and isolated, and show and she and and w with no hope, but what Dorothea doesn't tell you is that they were obviously sheltering. It was temporary. It was very temporary. No stove. No sleeping uh, arrangements. No bedding. And and every everyone at the time would know the difference between sheltering and camping. So uh, when they got back, uh, when Jim got back with the radiator and the chain, he reinstalled it, got the car running, and they proceeded on their journey to Watsonville. And they got there late afternoon. It's about a, it was about a three hour drive. And they pitched their tent, which we've never seen. And and got and fulfilled their 
placement and they they worked up in Watsonville. That's what happened. So um, I should, can you see that this is uh, looking outside out of the driver's side window on Thompson Avenue. This is also Google uh, Street View. Uh, th this is what it looks like when you're just outside of Napomo. And what the thing I want to point out is um, the eucalyptus trees. Uh, if you can see my cursor, this dark line here. Th that this ridge, is, yeah. Yeah, this is uh, eu eucalyptus trees. And it's actually not a ridge. They're, they're just lining the side of a field. Uh -huh. uh, the point is that, as we both know, you're California. It's a windbreak. It's a windbreak, right? It's a windbreak. And yeah. you see them everywhere in California, especially in that uh, coastal valley. Uh, and, you know, a stand of eucalyptus looked just like every stand of eucalyptus. This is uh, the view looking uh, through, the high, uh, through the high school property. And this stand of eucalyptus is uh, adjacent to the approved site, okay? And in this photo, uh, it's believed that these young eucalyptus uh, were, and I, I don't have a photo from a modern photo, but as essentially these are the mature eucalyptus. They claim they claim that this is the same stand, and it could be, you know, um, it it could be. But I'll, I'll tell you if if this was if the approved site was actually uh, where they set up the lean-to, the car was parked there. Mm -hmm. uh, it was very common back then. A man could fix a car back then, okay? You could take, the, look at this. They took the, <laughs> the, the <laughs> top of the engine off and, yeah. and, and they, they helped each other. These are probably three different families helping one guy on his car. The car was very important. Uh, you know, not long ago, Ron, uh, these this site was quite common even when, when we were kids. They were called shade tree mechanics. Yeah. They'd work on the car in the yard or maybe in the driveway if they had one. Yeah. And all the, the local, the neighborhood men would come over and, and help out. <laughs> Yeah, because it was uh, it it was interesting. It was entertaining. You know, yeah. I, I saw that going on in the, in the sixties. Yes, uh, but, but you don't see it anymore. Uh, of because course not. It, uh, it's <laughs> it's computerized, and so anyway, I, this illustrate this this photo was also taken by uh, Dorothea Lang, and you can see the eucalyptus trees. This is a different location, but there's eucalyptus trees right behind them. Mm -hmm. um, now, as an anecdote, and we're almost done, uh, as an anecdote from the family, this is very interesting. Florence, her, her, her kids bought a house for her in Modesto, a, a proper home. And she moved in, Florence moved in, and she lived there for a couple of years. And in fact, she was interviewed, I think she was interviewed in that home when they first found her, when the press first realized that the migrant mother was alive in Modesto. But after a couple of years, she didn't like it. And she told her kids, hey, I, I wanna move into a trailer. I want a trailer. And the kids uh, defined that and uh, for, for, for us as, she always loved to have to be on wheels. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she could sleep at night. She felt more comfortable on wheels because there was she. She always had that notion that if things got bad, she could move on. Isn't that interesting? Very that, interesting. So there's no way. There's no way that. Uh, uh, well. 
How much time we got? Well, we're running out, and I'd like to pick up this conversation when you get into Dorothea Lang's photographs of the uh, Japanese American concentration camps, especially how they contrast with her contemporary Ansel Adams. That's another discussion, a lengthy discussion. It, it is, and and I should, I'll just end with the, the short description. This, this is a this. Well, this let's is, make this a teaser for next time. But go ahead, we'll we'll wrap here, and then yeah, we'll wrap it here. Um, okay. Yeah, this is uh, one of the Dorothy's uh, Dorothea shots, and all I need to say at this point as the teaser is that you can see from this shot, the, these are the Japanese. Uh, Americans on the day that they're being uh, relocated by bus and train from Oakland to San Francisco. And they're, they're being incarcerated. And Dorothea went to Manzanar and she photographed the conditions at Manzanar. And by now she's, uh, this is six or seven years later and she's a very accomplished photojournalist. And she's so good that the government has impounded approximately 760 photos the public has never seen. That tells you how powerful they are. So, We're going to have to get those. We're going to have to sue the government for those or yeah, get an FO, yeah, FOIA, FOIA request. request. Yeah. So thank you, Daryl. Like, uh, I think that's a complete story. Do you have any uh, questions? Oh, it's incredible. You know, I can just go on and effuse uh, in the way that you have disrupted the historiography of surrounding Dorothea Lang and American uh, photog modern photography, but I'll let the people in the comment section do that on, on my behalf. Oh, thank we'll, you. We'll, we'll continue this conversation because this is a true breakthrough and it's right in the spirit of, of, of what this channel is meant to be. And that is yes. disrupting yes. the historiography, just like our, our colleague, George Webb, disrupted the whole historiography Absolutely. of an entire era. And, and we're doing it as citizen investigators, journalists, forensic analysts. Yeah. And Absolutely. we don't need no stinking badges. <laughs> so true. <laughs> okay, Ron, thank you very much. Well, we'll thank pick you, it up. Daryl. And okay. uh, we'll be talking soon. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much again. Bye-bye.